26 of the Huddy Hui. We're well and truly through to the business round of the Swindell Shield here in Wellington Club Rugby. And of course, we're well and truly into secondary school rugby, Adam. And yesterday, you commentated a game on audio on the Huddy Sports Facebook page. What an outstanding tradition it was yesterday. Wellington College getting the win. 31-27 over St. Pat Silverstream, a seismic result in Premier One because Wellington College have now played the top four sides from last year and could well earn a home semi-final by winning the remainder of their matches against opponents who are weaker in the standings after the first month of the competition. Silverstream led the game 22-10 at halftime. Toby Crosby, this very impressive number eight from Greytown, was rampant in the first half, scored twice and was held up twice. And then Wellington College rallied in the second half. Silverstream's discipline wavered and Jacob Waikari Jones' goal kicking was on target. And then there was a sensational moment about seven minutes from full time when young Stanley Solomon, the year 12, first 5 eight, big prospects, he caught the ball just outside the 22 and he basically ran through the entire Silverstream team and scored a try in the corner, which won Wellington College the game. Wellington College's rugby in recent times has been struggling, particularly at first 15 level, where they suffered record defeats and even failed to make the Premier One semi-finals. Yesterday, Wellington College was rocking. I haven't seen noise like that from the terraces for the best part of a decade. It was a sensational win for Wellington College, whose Fords are improving with their resilience and precision in each game. And in Stanley Solomon, they have a young back who's certainly one to ring fence. And of course, that uh, uh, club rugby's clip by Stephen White is certainly doing the rounds at him. That Stanley Solomon try, an absolute cracker. And someone that knows about playing in the big time is Campbell Woodmass. He's the Northern United halfback. He is our guest tonight on the Huddy Hui. Campbell, thank you for coming on the Huddy Hui. Great to see you uh, positioned yourself in front of the uh, representative jerseys and all black jerseys here at the club room. So you're saying Mike Parker was responsible <laughs> yeah. for the setup there. Um, yeah, no, of this- course. This weekend, you've got your massive game against your northern suburb rivals, uh, very soon probably to be called the Battle of Transmission Gully against Tawa. <laughs> um, Tawa, third on the table, north seventh, an important one for you guys with uh, three rounds to go in the Swindale Shield. Yeah, no, no, thanks for having me on, guys. I really appreciate it. Um, it is a big game. Um, wouldn't I would be lying if I, if I said it wasn't. Um, uh, it's, it's definitely a game that both clubs look forward to been right there, the rivals, and especially having the last, I don't know, three or four years, how the games have gone. Um, yeah, no, obviously it's just something that you want to get up for and play in these types of games. So we're talking off here before about the 2019 semi-final. Norths were 17-0 down, and you rallied in the second half to win 18-17, and you were instrumental in that game. Tell us about that uh, game and the pressure in the second half and what it's like to have such passionate and preaching supporters on the sideline that got you <laughs> home that day. Yeah. Um, now, what I remember of that game is, um, yeah, Coach G at halftime just going at us. And obviously, it's semifinals and um, emotions are high. Um, but going into that second half, as soon as the ball was kicked off, we were still quite calm about where we were um, in the game and what we could do. Um, there were games previously in that year where we would come back from big um, deficits. So um, we weren't, we weren't uh, rattled by that. Um, and we just kind of edged um, ourselves back into that game. And, and yeah, the history, like, yeah, is what it is. <laughs> Was there a turning point in that match? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, we kind of got a roll on. Um, and then there was the opportunity late in the half to kind of um, go for the shot at goal, um, which we did. And it kind of put us within reach to kind of um, get up and into the game. So, um, yeah, we knocked that over and we just kind of got a roll on from that. And um, the subs that came on, um, one in particular, Luca Rees, just, you know, was feeding for that ball. So we kind of fed off his, um, um, his energy and went from there. So, yeah, no, it was, it was good. Last year was the total opposite of that yeah. vibrant contest. 5-0. Explain what happened in that game. Yeah. <laughs> oh, just thinking about that one, we probably had a, about 100 
scrums pack down at five meters <laughs> out from the try line. Um, yeah, no, it's a complete different um, situation there, but um, same goes. It's it's um, always a big game against Tower, and and yeah, none of us wanted to kind of budge on that, and so um, yeah, just one of those another epic encounter against them. Because okay, Saturday's encounter um, out there at Lyndhurst Park uh, will be a stellar game. What is it that uh, Norths are looking to improve on, particularly since you had that massive win against Huddle Boys Maris, which really uh, changed your season? Yeah, I, th- I think just um, staying true to our patterns and um, what the boys have kind of been building on. Um, we've got a roll on, even though last week didn't really um, tell. Um, we're, we're trusting our systems uh, moving forward and we know that we're, our backs are up against the wall um, if we want to make kind of that top four push and, and that's where we want to end up. So um, it's not kind of um, pressing the alarm bells yet, but it's kind of um, backs are definitely up against the wall and um, quite desperate. Um, so we're going to harness that, use it um, and come out just, I guess, firing, yeah. When you say patterns and systems and structures, what do you mean? Mm-hmm. And are they different against Tawa, which is a local derby game? Um, when they they are um, in a sense that we know that they they are going to be very physical with us up front. Um, so we need to um, embrace that and just um, in knowing that. I don't want to give too much away here, fellas, but <laughs> um, in knowing that. Um, yeah, just kind of um, playing what's in front of us, really. Um, and, yeah, just keep the boys uh, being a halfback um, and being in that kind of um, uh, driver's seat, if you like, um, just keeping the ball in front of our pack and playing in the right half of the field and um, just making sure that we're making right decisions at the right time of the game. Of I understand there's a halfback who's turned up to North. Who's so average he might play first five this weekend. He's just left quarantine from Japan. Is TJ Perinara oh. going in front on Saturday? Uh, not that I know of. He's, he's shown face um, <laughs> up at, at training here, but um, as far as I'm aware, his, um, his clearance hasn't been um, put through. So we're, we're having a, a gain, a young experience, first five in the driver's seat this week. Um, so spending a bit of time with him kind of, getting through all of our patterns and making sure that he's as, as comfortable as he is um, when he jumps on the field on Saturday. And what's his name? And how do you, as an experienced halfback, cater for different first fives? You've played with a number of different first fives <laughs> and had yeah. a lot of success. Yeah. So um, we've had Zane Edwards and Junior. Oh, sorry. I can't remember his last name, Junior. Um but yeah, we've we've had those two jump in in the driver's seat, both quite inexperienced at that level. Um, so it's exciting for them. And what I tell all the kind of first fives I play with is is just play their game. Um, it it is a bit of a step up in levels when you come to Premier Rugby, but um, don't get kind of rattled by the occasion. You deserve to be there. Um, and whatever your decision is on that field, we're just going to go with it. Um, so, yeah, um, embrace the occasions that you get and just take um, take it with both hands and really get after it, really. So, uh, Campbell, of course, uh, TJ Piranar, you went to college with as well at, at Mana College. Tell us about uh, Mana College because that was quite a special first 15. Yeah, nah, it, it was. And, yeah, going along through the grades with TJ has been great. Obviously, um, he's a great footy player, but also a great man as well. Um, and going back to those, uh, that team in particular, um, you see so many of the boys kick on and do well um, uh, in, in their careers as well. Um, like going up this week against um, James Swell, I'm not sure if he's playing 10 this week or not, but um, he was in that team. And you see like Terence Hepatema overseas and, mm. and guys that have stuck around. Um, Parikura Lalanga, he's a legend here at North. Yeah. Um, so that group of boys going through that um, that school grade with them was just priceless and um, yeah, something that I, I hold on to. Eh? It's a, it's a, it was a brotherhood, definitely. And Mana have had a resurgence in a lot of sports recently. Why did they mm-hmm. fall away so dramatically and what have some of those older boys done to help 
things improve in 2021? Yeah, so um, oh, it's, it's great to see. Um, obviously, a qu- quite a small school like that has, has pegs and troughs. Um, but um, the, there's a group of boys at the moment, um, Putty Kuda, John White, um, TJ shows face from time to time. Um, they have um, an academy that's running there. Um, and it's just pretty much bringing in that young core group and just keeping them together in the community. Um, so it's keeping them right throughout the ranks of, of Norths and, and then going into that secondary school level as well. Um, and with Mana's success at the moment, um, I think it just really comes down to um, the boys that are there. They really are wanting to play footy um, and they've got that competitive nature back in where they're, um, trying to compete for their spots. Um, also, the the coaches there, they haven't, I don't think they've changed much over the last kind of 10 years. So um, they've kind of been growing and seeing what works well and what doesn't and just kind of honing that as well. So it, it's great to see them back up there and competing. Of course, Campbell, you spent some time up in Auckland. Of course, you played a few games for College Rifles, but also you played for uh, a club that has a great deal of history, the Ponsonby Rugby Club. Of course, yeah. you uh, earned your blazer up there for the club. Tell us about your time there, the great history of the Ponsonby Rugby Club, and the time you won the Gallagher Shield. Yeah, uh, that, that was definitely a special moment. Um, going up there, like you hear the stories of, of history and how dominant they were as a club and things like that. Um, but it, it didn't really hit me until I was there in the environment and seeing... Um, just all the kind of old boys come together and still help um, the team that was there kind of go through the, the lows and the highs. Um, it was really um, a family and or orientated club. I'd say it would be like, it would, it'd be similar to Norths, but obviously a lot older. Um, like looking back at Norths, obviously started in 1990, but having the success that it's had over that time, it's, um, it's great for the club, but that translates up in Auckland as well, where they've just been a powerhouse throughout the years. And going back, um, they've they've been on um, they've won the Gallagher Shield about like six times in recent years, like in a row. So um, they make sure when you're playing for that club that you don't forget what's gone before, but also that you're adding to the jersey and you're. You're, you're, you never own the jersey. Your your goal when you're wearing it is to add to it. Um, so those learnings that I had up there were priceless and really helped me on my journey. Um, and that Gallagher Shield final, oh, that that was just you know icing on the cake for me. That was that was great. And your journey brought you back to Wellington. Why was that? Um, I think. At that time in my rugby career, I kind of, I really wanted to um, push forward um, and I didn't see that opportunity up in Auckland. Um, And coming back home, obviously I saw that success that Norths were having. I saw um, there there was an opportunity to help my my team as well. Um, And also getting back to family, like nothing beats playing in front of, you know, um, mum, dad, um, brothers and sisters coming along and watching. Um, so having that there as well. And obviously, uh, me and my partner, we were kind of wanting to get into a house and things like that. And there was no chance that that was happening up in Auckland. So coming back down to Wellington, that was kind of on the cards. And um, um, jumping into work with my brother as well was, um, yeah, something I'd look forward to, to doing at the time. So took the opportunity, came back down, and, um, yeah, the rest is kind of history, really. And that 2019 season went really well. You won the Jubilee Cup. You won the Jim Brown medal as the player of the final. Recapture the final for us and also co- compare it to Auckland in terms of the difference in the way that Wellington approaches their rugby and Auckland approaches their rugby. Um. So going back to that 2019 final, um, obviously it was a it was a massive occasion. But at the same time, 
the team that had been there before, they'd been there the previous year, obviously it wasn't the result that they wanted, um, but they've had that finals experience. So um, going through the even semifinals to the finals, the boys really rallied and spent that quality time that you need, I think, leading up to a final. And you're just kind of, you're not bringing in anything new or, you know, you're just spending good quality time enjoying the week together in preparation. And um, I thought that going into that final, it really showed we were quite calm and, and collected and things that we were doing. It was, um, it was a sense that everyone was on the same page and obviously we were just going out because, like there because everyone wanted it. Um, and the occasion wasn't new. Um, so yeah, the boys just kind of just rolled and just went for it. it was, I think it got off to a bit of a shaky start. We had to play ourselves into it. Um, but being a halfback, running off guys like Jared Fito Tor and Waylon Baker and things like that, when they were going out there doing what they were doing on that day, it made my job a lot easier. And the, having the go forward that they presented, it was just so good to have. Um, going back to the difference in occasions, I think um, that was the first, uh, the Gallagher Shield, that was the first um, sense of finals footy that I'd had at that level. Like I'd made semifinals and things like that the previous couple of years for Ponsonby. Um, but having that occasion on Eden Park with the crowd and knowing that you've done, you've spent the whole year leading up to that point, um, it was it was an overwhelming experience, but also something that you kind of hold hold on to. Um, I remember there was yeah, obviously we had Tuesday trainings, Thursday trainings, Friday night. Um, Kevin Senior, um, our backs coach, he got everyone or all of our backs together, and we spent a night at Eden Park. Um, just having dinner and watching movies and playing games and all that kind of stuff. So I think just that sense of um, brotherhood and just um, um, the camaraderie that was there and just having a laugh together and things like that stood, uh, put us in good stead for um, what was to come on that, that Saturday. So um, a little bit of different approach from both finals and the game has played out a lot different um but yeah uh the the rugby up there i think is a lot a lot more technical I'm not saying that that's a bad thing um but up there you're kicking and kicking and kicking and, and until you're in the position probably about 40 meters out and then you attack um but obviously coming down back to wellington you're um you're trying to kick for um, um, territory and position, but not not so much in a position because of the wind factor. Um, you seem to be able to kick in one half, and that determines kind of where you where you're going to end up. So, um, yeah, that, that's kind of the big difference mm -hmm. between the two. Yeah. So during week, Campbell, you're a builder, and at the moment um, in the trades, uh, work is flat tech. Tell us about how you banish, no. banish your workload between uh, your work during the day, because you have the tools, going to training, you know, going to the game on Saturday. Um, but yeah. to also finish off, let's talk about your manager, Mike Parker. He's been involved with the club for a very long time, and he is instrumental in you getting your premier team organised for the games on Saturday. Oh, definitely. Um, no, Mike Parker is definitely one of those um, people behind the scenes that doesn't get the credit that's deserved. Um, he... Obviously, him um, and Matt Roundtree prepare uh, just everything so that Saturdays run smoothly, Tuesday, Thursdays run smoothly, smoothly for the boys, and we get everything that we need. Um, and with Mike, he keeps tabs on. Obviously, we don't have a statistician or um, anything like that at Norths, um, where I know that a lot of other clubs do. But Mike takes it on board and makes sure that. Um, He's oh the boys know kind of blazer games and fifties and like this week and um, we've got a couple of boys getting their blazers but Ethan Mate is running out for his one hundredth game so um 
knowing that before trainings and things like that, those, those are occasions where you want to get up for um, your brother and kind of um, really make sure that the boys are firing and making sure that you're trying to get out there and get that win, really. Um, sorry, I forgot the first part of that question. Oh, it's just about how you manage your time between building and play. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So um, it, it is quite tough. Um, I am in a lucky position where my brother um, is, is my boss while I'm, I'm working for him. So he gives me that leeway. Um, obviously, when the tool belt's on, I'm, I'm there to work. Uh, but then he lets me kind of take it off, you know, 3 30, 4 o'clock most days so I can get to where I need to get to and have the enough rest that I need to to kind of um, get ready for for rugby. Yeah. Well, Campbell, it's uh, been f- fantastic having you on the Huddy Hui. All the best against Tower on Saturday. Cheers, guys. I really appreciate all the work that you do for um, club rugby. And um, yeah, all the best. Catch up soon. Thank you, Campbell. Cheers, guys. Adam, you've got the call on Saturday on the Etu Whanau Footy Show, Te Apuka o Te Ika, level 61 AM. It's always an epic game between Tawa and Norths. What are you looking forward to in that game this weekend? Well, the local crowd and the local occasion really is what I'm looking forward to. It's always a very friendly and competitive atmosphere. Lyndhurst Park, superb hospitality in the occasions that I've been present. And I'm also very much looking forward to seeing if Norse, who have had a stuttering season so far, can rise to the challenge of Tawa at home. Now, Tawa was stunned by Huddle Boys Marist last Saturday, conceded three late tries to lose that game. But generally, they've been very strong this year, knocked over Marist St. Pat's, and only have two losses. Norse have been very inconsistent. First round, blanked by Old Boys University. I saw them play Auries, where they were ahead 16-5 and were overrun by a brilliant Magpies team in the second half. Then they beat Hutt Old Boys Maris 34-12. And so their form, which has been super consistent in the last three years, has been topsy-turvy, This year, they have had some changes. The Colts team's vanished, and so numbers are down. But also, they lost a number of key personalities at Mm. the start of the year. Keenan Higgins, Lossi Filippo, Gerard Fatatoa, just to name a few. And so, Norse have had an inconsistent team, which has probably led to more inconsistent performances. But they still have a core group like Campbell Woodmass, like Parakura Lalanga, who are capable of winning this competition. So can North step up and really make an assault at that top echelon or will Tawa continue to dominate? Well, for North to win this sad day is important because they've got two relatively straightforward games to finish off the Swindale Shield. They've got Wellington and Johnsonville. So for North, it's all to play for this sad day. Um, Adam, last weekend, you didn't call any rugby in Wellington. You had the privilege of going over to Greytown uh, and you took over a very special guest with you and Dion Waller. The Jubilee Cup was in uh, Greytown last Saturday, Brad, and the Jubilee Cup hasn't been in Greytown since 1883. Greytown engraved on the Jubilee Cup, shared the honour with the Wellington Football Club, and what happened was between 1880 in 1885, Wairapa and Wellington were combined in club competition. And in 1883, Greytown played Masterton twice for the right to earn a passage through to the Jubilee Cup final, or the Senior Cup Challenge Finals, it was called then, against the Wellington Football Club. There were two nil draws between Greytown and Masterton, but after a dispute, Greytown went to play the final on October 3, 1883 at 4 p.m. The game actually kicked off at 4.25 p.m. Such was the size of the (laughs) crowd. And in 1883, rugby was very different. The referee wasn't the sole judge of fact. He had no whistle, and he was supported by two umpires who ran the touchline like contemporary assistants. And those officials were appointed by the respective sides. 
The word try originates from the attempt to take a kick for goal, which was the only method of scoring in mm. rugby in 1883. So what happened in this uh, final is Greyhound scored the first try and it was undisputed. Wellington scored a try, which was contested by the Greytown umpire. There was a massive dispute, which held up the game for several minutes. And then the Wellington umpire and the referee decided to give the try, which meant it was nil all. But Greytown were essentially cheated out of a leading position. The game continued. It was spiteful. So they called it off at six o'clock. <laughs> and then two weeks later, after a judicial hearing, it was resolved by the Wellington Rugby Union that the local side, Wellington Football Club, would retain the Jubilee Cup. But the Jubilee Cup, which was presented in 1929 to coincide with the 50th anniversary of the Wellington Rugby Union, has Greytown engraved on it. So obviously the engraver was from Masterson or Greytown or the Y Rapper because we don't have those skills in Wellington. It's more liberal swipe card types <laughs> who work in government departments. And so we, Dion Waller and I went to Greytown last Saturday on their old timers day. 1876, that club was founded. It's one of the oldest in New Zealand to share that story. It was a real joy. And the great thing for Greytown is they won two pieces of silverware that day. They beat Ekatahuna by 63 to 21 to win the Lane Pen Memorial Trophy. Now, Lane Penn was the legendary wire rapper coach alongside Brian Lahore. They beat Canterbury, who held the Ramperley Shield in 1985, produced a number of very good All Blacks, including one of the football club's very own Marty Berry, and they are cooking in that wire rapper mm -hmm. competition, unbeaten, and they won the Lane Penn Trophy against Ekadahuna, which is essentially the final of this competition they have up there between the city clubs and the country clubs. Fantastic story and some unique history there around the Jubilee Cup. And uh, who would have thought about the drama of the uh, Jubilee Cup? A fantastic story. Adam did some fantastic history in the lead up to that trip over the hill. And this Saturday, I'm going over the hill, working with uh, Sideline.Live and Grassroots Rugby. Uh, it's Carterton who are celebrating um, the winning decades, their old timers day, and that's also going to be a grassroots venture. They're playing Martinborough, and it's the second round of that competition, Adam. And uh, Carterton, of course, is a relatively strong club in the wire wrapper, and they've had some good success until late. Absolutely, that'll be a great day. The rugby in Greytown was excellent. Uh, Zach Guilford, uh, evidently playing for Greytown, scored mm. a try and set up another couple of personalities well-known in Wellington in the Greytown team. Chris Hemi was injured with a shoulder complaint, but he's in the front row for Greytown, as is Tolu Fahamukiora, former Jubilee Cup winning prop from Tawa, played for the Māori All Blacks, Tolu. He's hmm. performing very strong. In fact, Greytown scored a try from a penalty from the scrum five metres out. And Dominic Hurlihy is also over there. His father played for... Greytown. Big Dom worked in the Cambridge Hotel for a period and won a number of championships with the Billy Goats Colts. Very fine player, Dominic Hurley. And of course, our other game on sideline.live this week is Rungatai College versus St. Bernard's College. And that is for the Jim Ting Memorial Cup. He's a teacher at uh, both schools in the past over the years. So uh, that's the other game on sideline.live and Huddy Sports this week. And well, Adam... When we were out at Eastbourne a few weeks ago, there was also Nadi Pro East Coast celebrating 100 years, and Kevin here sent me down uh, his publication celebrating the centenary. This is issue number 28, and uh, it's a document full of history. And on the back cover, it has the Rugby World Cup in front of George Nepia's gravestone. Beautiful photograph, that, of uh, George Nepia's gravestone with the Rugby World Cup. Uh, George Nepia was so famous in 1924, he played all 32 games on the Invincibles Tour. He was an electrifying fullback. He was 45 years old when he played his last game of first-class rugby with the Sun. And in 1982, the Maori All Blacks toured Wales and George Nepia was summoned to halfway to perform 
an interview with Keith Quinn, who was commentating the games mm. for television New Zealand. And the ground announcer announced to the crowd that George Nepia was on the field. So they recognized this elderly man 58 years after he had toured with the Invincibles and he received a standing ovation, which lasted several minutes. Mm. George Nepia, the most iconic player in Nati Pro East Coast rugby. And so next week, Adam, on the Hari Hui, we're, um, as well as probably having a rugby guest, we're going to interview someone rather different. And of course, <laughs> you had an experience this evening against this young man who absolutely destroyed you in the game of Tempin Bowling. Remarkable experience. The next door neighbour of Graham Murray, the former All Black captain, mm. is 13-year-old Ben Pettit. Ben Pettit is the New Zealand Tempin Bowling champion. And he's a teenager at Hutton International Boys School. And I met him tonight in Whitby. And we went Tempin Bowling and he kicked my ass. I've never been so humbled by a 13-year-old in my life. This is an extraordinary story of a young man with a huge dedication and skill for the sport of Tempin Bowling. He has bowled 279 in his career, which is one pin short of the perfect game and the perfect score of 300. Tonight, when I played him, he bowled 266, and I bowled 91. Well, that's not bad, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> he doubled my score. That's incredible. And so he'll so be... Ben Pettit uh, is going to be on the program next week. He is a very special young man, and I'm looking forward to uh, sharing his success and his uh, story with the audience because he is worthy of acclaim, and temp and bowling is a sport which is social to a lot of people. He introduced me to new concepts like oil on the lane, and... He even bowls two-handed, which I've never seen before. Oh, so wow. uh, Ben Pettit will be a lot of fun next week. Trust me, folks. Oh, we'll be looking forward to that interview. So that will be a fantastic episode of the Huddy Hui next week. But many thanks for listening for this weekend's Huddy Hui. A shout-out to Ethan Loveridge, refereeing his first premier game this weekend. Go well, young referee. And also to Finn, who helped pack up all the scaffolding last week. That's the Huddy Hui for tonight. We'll see you next week. Ciao for now.